right. Are you ready to get into Yah's Word today? All right, I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 15. We're going to begin with verse 22 in just a moment. And I've entitled this message today, The Bitter Waters Made Sweet. So we're going to be talking about the episode of when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. The Almighty led them out with a mighty hand, with mighty signs, wonders, and miracles. And they started out across the land, and then they finally got out into the wilderness. And they got out there for three days, and they ran out of water. And so we're going to get to find out what happened when they came under a little pressure, when they were tried a little bit. We'll see how they responded, and then we'll take what happened there and apply it to our lives as well. So Exodus chapter 15, beginning with verse 22, I want you to pay real close attention to all of these wonderful phrases and words. And Moshe brought Israel from the Sea of Reeds, also known as the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. So now they're kind of off the road, and they've gotten out in the wilderness. It's a little rougher than where they've been before. And it says, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So you know that's a crisis when you're three days into the wilderness, into a rough terrain, and there is no water. And they came to Mara. All right, so that word in Hebrew will give you a little hint of what's going to actually transpire. The word Mara in Hebrew means bitter. All right, so they came to a place that was named Bitter. Well, that's a tough place to be, don't you think? How many of you have ever been to a place called Bitter? I know that I've been there. It may not have had a sign out when you passed into town, but you've been to a place called Bitter. I know I have. If you've lived very long, you've been there. Can you say amen? amen. And they came to Mara, to Bitter, and they were unable to drink the waters of Mara, for they were what? Bitter, bitter waters. They're unable to drink. Their thirst is not satisfied. So the name of it was called Mara. And the people grumbled against Moshe. All right, well, that's human nature. People have a tendency to grumble when their needs aren't being met. And they grumbled against Moshe, the one that the Almighty had anointed to bring them out of slavery. It's interesting how you can be delivered from slavery, but if you get a little thirsty... It affects your disposition, and you're tempted to grumble. Now, you were, you were singing Moshe's praises just a few days ago, you know, as a mighty emancipator, a mighty deliverer, and now you're grumbling about him because you're thirsty, all right? The people grumbled against Moshe, saying, what are we to drink? Then he cried out to Yah. Now, there's a reason why he's the leader. I have people that come to me and, you know, they have problems and situations that are going on in the ministry and all that, and, and I give a solution. And, and then my answer a lot of times tongue-in-cheek is, that's why I'm the pastor. So there's a reason why Moshe was the pastor, because while the people were grumbling, he cried out to Yah. He had the solution. Can you say amen? Now, doesn't that set him apart? You can go talk to another man and grumble all you want, but it's not going to change anything. If you want something changed, you go talk to the Almighty who is well able. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think according to what? The power that's at work in us. The power of the Ruach HaKodesh or the set-apart spirit. Then he cried out to Yah, it says. And Yah showed him a tree. Now I want you to keep that in mind because that's really going to mean something to us. So there's a real problem. Moshe cries out to the Almighty. And Yah shows him something. He shows him something. Now, he could have done a lot of other things, don't you think? He could have automatically just brought water shooting up out of the ground, or he could have caused it to rain. He could have caused it to do a lot of things. But instead, he showed him something. There was a revelation, so keep that in mind. Yah showed him a tree. And when he threw it into the waters, so when this tree had contact with the bitter waters, the waters were made sweet. In other words, drinkable. Hallelujah. There he made a law and a right ruling for them. And there he tried them. All right, he tested them. So think about it. I mean, they had been in slavery all those generations, hard labor, 
They hadn't been paid. And when the Almighty was about to bring them out, he said, now go talk to your Egyptian neighbors and ask gold and silver and precious things. And the scripture says the Almighty gave favor, placed favor on the Israelites. And the Egyptians gave them their gold and their silver and all their precious things. And the Israelites plundered the Egyptians and came out with all this wealth. Well, we know that they were a part of and an eyewitness to all those miracles that took place, all of those mighty plagues and, and, uh, and even the parting of the sea and, uh, and all of that. And so, I mean, there were, there were tremendous miracles uh, that took place. And the Almighty wanted to test them. He wanted to try them. He wanted to see what they were made of. Just because you're his people doesn't mean that he won't try you and test you and see if you really believe what you say you believe. How many of you know talk is cheap? There's a lot of people talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And as soon as they get three days into the wilderness and it gets a little dry, then instead of praying, they start grumbling and complaining. Well, I'm just going to tell you that I've read the entire Bible many times and I've not found one place where grumbling produces something of benefit. I've not found one example where complaining and backbiting and slandering and evil speaking has ever produced anything good. So I just want to encourage you never to go that route. So if you get into a dry place, if you get into a place called Mara, do like Moshe and cry out to the one who can change things. Don't just find an ear that will listen to your gripe and your complaint. Amen. And your criticism. And then don't let somebody fill your ears with that type of thing. When somebody wants to criticize and slander and say all oh, manner of evil against someone, just say, do these look like trash cans to you? This is not a receptacle for your, for your garbage, so, so keep it to yourself. Can you say amen? All right. There he made a law and a right ruling for, the, for them, and there he tried them, or he tested them, verse 26, and he said... If you diligently obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes and shall listen to his commands. Some people don't even want to hear it, especially today. They don't want to hear anything about commands. And shall guard all his laws. Notice, here's the promise. I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites, on the Egyptians. For I am Yah who heals you. Now, this is a covenant promise. And this is even before Moshe received the Torah. The Almighty makes a covenant promise to his people that if they will diligently obey his voice and do what's right in his eyes and listen to his commands and guard all his laws, that he will not bring any of the diseases upon them that he brought upon the Egyptians. And he declares himself, I am Yah who heals you. So that ought to encourage all of us that, one of the first names by which the Almighty reveals himself is by the covenant name of our healer. He is our healer. Can you say amen? So let me just give you a few points that I've gleaned from this passage, because there's a lot that we can take home from this passage. The first thing I want to say is there is a wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people think that if they just believe upon Yeshua, if they get born again, then everything's going to be just fine. Life's going to be rosy. There's not going to be any problems. And there's a real problem with that mindset because it, it's completely out of touch with reality. It's not even congruent with the promises that Yeshua made about this life. We know in John chapter 16, verse 33, Yeshua said, In the world... You have pressure or tribulation, your translation may say. But take courage, I have overcome the world. All right, so your Bible may say, in this world, you're going to have tribulation or trials or difficulties or hardships. You can fill in the blanks. This is a promise from the one who knows. This is a promise from Yeshua. He's saying in this world, you're going to face hardships and difficulties and trials. All kinds of things are going to come against you. You just got to know that's the nature of this life that, that we're in. He says, but take courage. In other words, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
So Yeshua is the ultimate overcomer, and he lives in each one of us by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the set-apart spirit. And so Yeshua, the overcomer, empowers us through the spirit to be overcomers. There's not one situation that you will face in life that you cannot overcome trusting in Yah, in the covenant that you have through the blood of Yeshua. Yeshua has set the example. The Bible says that we're to keep our eyes on him, looking unto him, the author and perfecter of our faith walk. He didn't say his faith walk. He lived for us. He lived as an example for us. And he overcame all things so that we could know that there's no trial, no difficulty, no temptation, no testing. That is too great. No hardship, no sickness or disease. That is too great for the Almighty. Is there anything too hard for y'all? That's a question in Scripture with an answer. No, there's nothing too hard for Yah. The overcomer lives in you. And if you're discouraged today, I want you to know, it's not by man's power nor by man's might, but by the Spirit, says Yah Hose. All right, so if you're just trusting in your own strength, you will fail. But if you're trusting in the overcomer who lives in you, you will also overcome. Can you say a big amen? Now, let me take it a little further. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 35. This is Shaul, the apostle Paul writing. He says, who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Shall pressure or distress or persecution or scarcity of food or nakedness or danger or sword And all of these things are things that we face in this life. As it has been written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are reckoned as sheep of slaughter. This is just Shaul saying that we can expect to experience difficulties like the ones he just listed in this life. But look at verse 37. But in all this, in all what? All of these trials and hardships and difficulties that he just mentioned and any other thing that he didn't mention. But in all this, we are what? More than overcomers. Your translation may say conquerors. Through him who loved us. Yeshua loved us when he died for us on the tree. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, that encompasses all things, nor messengers, that's angels, or principalities or powers, neither the present nor the future. That's things that are happening right now or things that might happen in the future nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Those are funny words kind of put together that just means any other thing that might come your way. All right, any other created thing that might come your way shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Messiah Yeshua, our master. So we're just simply saying, as we read earlier today, that we're to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Amen. We're to lighten the load by believing that he is our need meter. He's the one who perfects those things that concern us. He's on the job. He's the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps. Aren't you glad you have an Elohim that doesn't take a nap? Now, why is that important? Because you want to know you can take a nap or you can go to sleep at night and he's still on the job. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And he watches over his word to perform it on our behalf. The scripture says in Psalm 34, verse 19, many are the evils. Your Bible may say afflictions of the righteous, but Yah delivers him out of them all. And so this is a balanced view, not the idea that if you believe upon Jesus, everything's going to be perfect. All right. Yeshua never even promised that. This is the balanced view. There are many evils out there. There are many afflictions. You have to fight the good fight of belief, the scripture says. Shaul told us that, to fight the good fight of belief. So life is a fight, and it's all right if you're in the midst of a fight. Don't be discouraged and don't feel condemned. Don't feel like you're losing or or that you're less than others. A lot of people put on a great face, a great show. They like to walk in what appears to be victory, but they're fighting battles too. Everybody's got something they're working through. Can you say amen? So be encouraged. Many are the evils of the afflictions of the righteous, but Yah delivers him out of them all. There's no affliction too great for the Almighty. He is able. Amen? Hallelujah. And the scripture tells us that Yah uses the wilderness of this life 
to humble us and to try us and to teach us about himself. All right, and it's important. Why was Moshe the leader? There's a, a very obscure little verse uh, in the scriptures that, that tells us a lot about Moshe. We usually read right over it. It says that Moshe was the most humble person on the planet, on the earth. Humility is very, very important, not only for a successful life, but if you're going to be a leader, you need to be humble because pride goes before a fall. The arrogant ones fall eventually. Can you say amen? And we really do need to be thankful for every day we're given. You hear young people praying. A lot of times they say, you know, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And you think, well, they just say that because they don't have much else to say. But really, we need to have the belief of children, don't we? And when we get up in the morning, we really have to go to this basic base place, this foundational place that's just extremely humble and extremely thankful that the Almighty granted us another day. Because in essence, figuratively, you died the night before. You were buried in your grave clothes and covered up in your, in your sheets. And you were acting out the time when, when you're going to, to, to be in the grave, in essence. And when you wake up the next morning, that's the mercy of the Almighty. And you, we all need to be thankful. I mean, truly thankful that he resurrected us from the dead one more time. Amen. And if you can get to that place and walk in humility, and that's what the scripture teaches us to do, to walk in humility. Don't just say, I'm going to do this next week, and I'm going to do this two months from now, and I'm going to do that. What does the scripture tell us to do? Say, Yah willing. Yah willing. See, that's the, the, the humble place to be. Yah willing, I'm going to be here next week with you. Yah willing, we're going to go to Israel in November this year. Amen. Hallelujah. Yah willing. That's the humility. But how many of you know we're not really born with humility? I mean, you don't see children being humble. I mean, the very first thing that most children learn, the first word, at least in the English language, is mine. <laughs> Am I telling you the truth? They learn mine. They learn no. At first, a lot of times they tell their mom or their dad no. And then they learn mine. Isn't that right? And so we have some lessons that we need to, to learn and the wilderness of our lives, that's the place to learn them. The Almighty uses the wilderness of our lives, the bitter places, to teach us these things. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting with verse 1. It says, Guard to do every command which I command you today, that you might live. Now, I want you to say this, and I want you to really understand what you say. Yah wants me to live. He wants you to have life. He wants you to enjoy life. Yeshua said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So he wants you to live. Guard to do every command which I command you today that you might live and shall increase. Say, he wants me to grow. And go in. Say, he wants me to progress and not stagnate. And shall possess the land which Yah swore to your fathers. He wants me to take hold of my spiritual inheritance in Messiah. Can you say that? He wants me to take hold of my spiritual inheritance in Messiah. Okay? Verse 2. And you shall remember. So there's some things that we need to remember. That Yah, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Now, when we talk about the wilderness here in Scripture, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the children of Israel being in their wilderness. How about your wilderness? Do these same principles apply to your wilderness? You may be in a wilderness right now. You know, I know recently I've, I've been in a wilderness uh, after being uh, in contact with toxic air in India on a missions trip. You know, I've, I've had to fight my way back to hell. So I've, I've been in a wilderness. So these principles apply to me, and I'll be the first one to admit that, that I've been in a wilderness, and I've been working my way through the wilderness with the strength and the, and the mercy of the Almighty. Hallelujah. So this may apply to something you're going through right now. But Elohim said that he led them these 40 years in the wilderness. So he's going to lead you through your wilderness experience. The, the psalmist wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You're not going to die in the wilderness. You're not dying in the valley. If you, if you follow the shepherd, he's going to lead you through the valley that you're currently in. Can you say amen? But notice what the purpose of the wilderness is. To humble you. To find that true place of humility. 
to prove you. That means to test you, to see if you're all of what you say you are or what you think you are. To know what is in your heart. Something about the wilderness that will really show what's in your heart. I mean, they're all singing the praises of the Almighty who brought them out of Egypt. They get three days into the wilderness without water. And their song is a different song. We're going to find out what's in your heart by putting you under a little pressure. Amen. All right. To humble you, prove you, to know what's in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not. All right, so he wants to see if you're going to follow him and obey him even in the midst of the trial. And he humbled you. Have you ever been humbled by a trial or a life situation? If you allow it, your willingness will often lead you to a deeper intimacy with the master, a greater reliance and trust in him. Amen. So we don't, we don't curse the trial. We actually see the good that comes of the wilderness experience that we are in. It says, and let you suffer hunger. He let you go through some things and fed you with manna. He let you hunger so he could show you that he could feed you. Amen. So that you could come to the place where you realize that you can't feed yourself. He's the one that's going to feed you. He's got to get you away from the donut shop and put you out there in the wilderness where there's no water, no food to show you that he is your provider. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? That you don't truly provide for yourself, that he's the one who provides for you. That's walking in that humility we're talking about. He let you suffer hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to make you know or to teach you something. See, we need to always ask, what does Yah want me to learn through this trial? What valuable lesson can I extract through this hardship? If you learn nothing through your hardship, you've missed out on the greatest gift Amen. of the trial. Because we don't learn. We don't develop when times are good. We, we really don't. We develop and we learn things when times get tough. All right, We become different people. We're made uh, under pressure. Amen. Can you say amen? Kind of like a diamond. You know, a diamond is made out of uh, coal that's put under pressure. And, uh, and so when, we, when we're under pressure, that's when we're truly made. And I, I can look back on 57 years of life and tell you that, that I've been made mostly uh, when I was under distress and under pressure. And I had to make decisions based on whether I wanted to satisfy my flesh or whether I wanted to please the master. And each time that, that I did it his way, I came out finer, uh, more developed, more mature, stronger, ready to do more. And some people think, well, that trial is going to kill him. I mean, that, that trial, boy, that's going to that's gonna put him under. No, that trial is going to make me. Amen. Let me say it again because it, it didn't seem like I convinced you. <laughs> that trial, if you let your trial, it will make you. When people want to bury you, Yah will resurrect you. Amen. And, and it was a different Yeshua that came out of that grave than the one that went in. Although the one that went in was very, very wonderful and very, very special. The one that came out was glorious with a glorified human body. Amen. Now, the original one did some pretty fantastic things as well. But my point is, if you go into that grave, you're going to come out better stronger, more capable, more qualified. Amen. Amen. Wisdom isn't something that you just pick up that's blowing in the wind. You got to experience some things to be wise, to become wise. Amen. People say, boy, you got a lot of wisdom growing out of your face right now. I sure do. It, it, it used to be all dark. <laughs> But I wouldn't trade wisdom for anything. Amen. Amen. And so the, the trial that, that others thought, especially the enemy thought, would bury me is the one that made me. See, what we don't do as people, now I'm getting way off of the track here, but I, I'm just following the Spirit. What we don't do as people is realize these things. And we think because a leader goes through a trial or somebody attacks that leader, there must be something wrong with that leader. And it may very well be that the Almighty is just preparing that leader for the greater 
more wonderful, more powerful things that are ahead. And you've got to be mature to be able to handle those things. Can you say amen? So I would just encourage you. I, I, I take the same encouragement before, before I give up on somebody that's going through a trial. I, I need to find out. I need to ask myself the question. Now, what is the Almighty doing with that man or that woman? And, and what is that man or woman going to be like on the other side of the empty tomb? Amen. And I want to be a part of that. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All right. So, to make you know or to teach you something, the Scripture says, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah. He wants us to rely upon His Word. He wants us to shape our lives by His Word. The Word is not just something that sits there on our nightstand collecting dust. It is what defines us. It is what shapes us if you allow it to. It will make you. If you ignore it, you will break yourself. Amen. Notice it says, Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Yeah, you went through some difficult times, but he was with you, and he provided miracles all along the way. Amen. Thus you shall know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so Yah, your Elohim, disciplines you. What does that mean? He makes a disciple out of you. If you truly want to be a disciple, then you have to be willing to be discipled by him as he takes you through the wilderness that you're going through. Can you say amen? He's going to develop you and mature you and make a disciple out of you. Bring some discipline. Since when did you ever discipline yourself when everything was going right? We take latitude when everything's going right. You know what I'm saying? We get slack on ourselves. We... we we, we don't, we're not as hard on ourselves, but when things get tough, we have a tendency to allow discipline to come into our lives, all right? So your, your wilderness trial can make a disciple out of you if you'll allow it. Verse 6, therefore, we can imply as a disciple of Yah, you shall guard the commands of Yah, your Elohim, to walk in His ways and to fear Him. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of Yah is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the set-apart one is understanding. Verse 7, for Yah your Elohim is bringing you into a good land. Can we just pause for a moment and say la on that? You're in the wilderness now, but you're on your way to what? A good land. A good land. That is his desire for us, to be in a good land. Yah is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. We're talking about a good land. Amen. A land of blessing, a land of eternal joy in his presence. It goes on to say a land of streams of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. I'm getting hungry just thinking about this. A land in which you eat bread without scarcity, in which you do not lack at all. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you dig copper. Would you, would you continue on through the wilderness if you knew this was going to be where you ended up? W would you hang in there? Would you follow the shepherd? If you knew this is where you were going, where he was taking you? Okay, look at verse 10. And you shall eat and be satisfied and shall bless Yah your Elohim for the good land which he has given you. So I want to bring it in to the apostolic writings and kind of give the equivalent. Shaul wrote it in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. What did he say? And we know that all matters work together for good to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to his purpose. All right. Now, how many matters? All matters. Your wilderness matters? All matters. What about the matters of your trial? All matters. What about the matters of your, your physical situation? All matters. What about the matters of your relationships? All matters. If we're following our shepherd through the wilderness, we know this and we know. Aren't you glad we can know some things? And we know that all matters. Everything. Work together for good to those who love Elohim. How many of you love Elohim? 
to those who are called according to his purpose. All right, so here's the thing. You don't have to work good matters together for good. They're already good. So he takes the good and the bad and the difficult and the trials and the hardships and the disappointments and the moments of, of, of doubt, and he works it all together for good. The outcome is going to be good. And, you know, when Yeshua was talking about belief, he didn't say don't have doubts in your mind. He says if a man doesn't doubt where? In his heart. Because the mind is the battleground of, of Satan. If he's going to attack you, he's going to attack you in your mind. So if you're going to get a doubt, it's going to be in your mind. So don't be condemned because you have a doubt in your mind. He'll put a doubt in your mind and then condemn you for having it. So that's why Shaul says we're to take every thought captive. You, you've got to manage your own mind. You're responsible for that real estate between your two ears. So if you have a rogue thought, and that's the way I like to think of them, a rogue thought, don't for a second get under condemnation and start saying, oh, I can't believe I thought that, like you owned it. Right? Don't own it. It's a rogue thought. It didn't come from you. It came from the enemy. All right? What do you do with, with a thought that's breaking the law? You pull it over, you slap the cuffs on it, you take it down to the station, you book it, you throw it in a cell, and you, you put it in a place where it has no power over you. That's what managing your mind's all about, taking every thought captive. So you've got to be able to determine what's a rogue thought and what's a thought that came from you. Okay, if you'll fill your, your mind with the word, then you'll think thoughts that come from the word. Now, in the same manner, something happens in, in your life, and immediately a scripture pops up into your mind. You think the enemy gave you that? No. So we, we empower that one, right? We grab hold of that one and hang on to that one and give it all the power it needs, right? It's the rogue thought that you take captive and you render it powerless, all right? So that's why Yeshua didn't say, don't doubt in your mind. He knew better. He said, don't doubt in your heart. Amen. Once you've processed it, once you've managed your mind, once you've gotten your mind in the right place, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on him. So if you want peace in your mind, keep your mind on him. Amen. Amen. And don't doubt in your heart. All right. So we need to move on. So we know that there is a wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. So they went three days into the wilderness. They couldn't find any water. And this was a major test from Yah to see if they would trust him. Now, don't think for a second that Yah won't do that in your life. He does all kinds of wonderful things for you. He provides for you. He does miracles for you. But every now and then, he will test you. Now, he won't give you a test that's too great for you. But he wants to see what you're made out of, to see if you truly mean what you say. All right? He is Yah, and you are not, so he can do what he wants to. Can you say amen? amen? Yeshua even prayed, lead us not into temptation, right? But deliver us from the evil one. I mean, nobody wants it, right? But there are, there are times when we, when we need to be tested. So I want to talk briefly about what some survival experts call the rule of threes. And, and here it is. You can live three minutes without air. All right, in the harsh environment, you can have three hours uh, to survive without shelter. So you're going to have to build a shelter in a harsh environment. You only have three hours. After three days, you're in a crisis situation without water. Your body begins to shut down. And you can make it three weeks without food. Now, some of you are thinking you want to eat right now. I understand. <laughs> but that's the rule of threes. They had gone out in the wilderness. See, they, they had tracked on the road for, for a while. But they got off the road, and they got out into the harsh wilderness. And they'd gone three days without water. So that produced a crisis. This is... A real crisis. These are people who are, are very worried now about, uh, about not having enough water to drink. And they had already used up the stores of water that they brought out of Egypt. Yah wanted to know some things. He wanted to know how the people would respond to a crisis. And he'd already delivered them out of slavery with mighty signs and wonders. He brought them through on dry ground, through the sea on dry ground. He wanted to know if they would trust him to be their source of, of provision. So had they really learned that Elohim was a miracle provider? Did they truly believe in the great I am? 
Who's an ever-present help in time of need? This is a test. And so they were searching desperately for water. Now, the question is, were they searching for the right thing? It might make sense that they were because they, they were thirsty. But their focus was on their need, and they weren't searching diligently for the need meter. They had forgotten about Yah and, and the fact that he could do miracles, and they were focusing only on their need, only on their issue. And, and so we, we hear Yeshua teaching us in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 31, Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? So don't think for a second Yeshua is not reflecting back on these passages in the Torah that we're reading right now. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. For all these the nations seek for, and your heavenly Father knows that you need all these. But seek first, before you seek anything else, the reign of Elohim and His righteousness or His right way of living and all these other things that you believe that you need shall be added to you. So this is just Yeshua putting it into the proper perspective and priority. He says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the business of the master. Yeshua discovered at an early age, age of 12, I must be about my father's business. Seek first the master. Seek his business. Seek first his kingdom. And if you put him first, then all the things that you need will be added to you. Now, I know that you've heard this before, and if you're not careful, you can let this principle just go right over your head or slip right past you. But this is a very important teaching. This is a promise. This is a teaching that has a promise built into it. Uh, you know, we have a commandment in the Ten Words to honor your father and your mother. And the Scripture says it's the first command with promise that it might go well with you and you'll live a long life on the earth. So honoring your father and your mother is is a commandment, but it also has a built-in promise. The promise is long life. Things are going to go well for you, and you're going to live a long life. So if you're concerned about living long and living happily, then you're going to want to honor your father and your mother. And it doesn't say only honor them if they did well or, or if they were superb parents. Or It says honor your father and your mother, period. Yeah. And if you'll do that, and boy, that's another sermon altogether, then the, the promise will be yours. Things will go well with you, and you'll live a long life. Amen. And so this is also a command with a promise. Seek first, Yeshua says, the reign of Elohim, the kingdom of Elohim, and His right way of living. Make those things priority. And if you do that, all the things that you need will be added. Now, can you trust Him? I mean, that's the, that's the trial here, right? Can, can we trust Him? Is He trustworthy? All right. If we'll do these things, seeking first the kingdom and live rightly, then what we need will be added. We have a promise in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my Elohim shall fill all your need according to His riches in esteem by Messiah Yeshua. Just a couple of other verses to encourage you along this line. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans... I am planning for you, declares Yah, plans of peace and not evil to give you a future and an expectancy or a hope. Then you shall call on me and shall come and pray to me and I shall listen to you, verse 13, and you shall seek me and shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Again, that's another promise built in. If you seek him, you will find him if you search for him. With all your heart. So if you get in the wilderness and you have a need, you're lacking water or food, do you start grumbling like they did? Do you start doubting? Do you start thinking woe is me statements? Or do you start seeking the one who can change the situation? I think you know the answer. John chapter 7, verse 37. And on the last day, the great day of the festival, Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and let him who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of his innermost shall flow rivers of living water. And this he said concerning the spirit, which those believing in him were about to receive. And so if your innermost being is thirsty, Yeshua is the one who satisfies the longing soul. Can you say amen? He is the living water. He's the one who will bring your thirst to an end. 
And then we want to move on. The third thing we want to take a look at here is that Yah allowed them to find what they were looking for, but it was bitter. Now, this is really a powerful statement if you think about it. They were only focused on water. That didn't please the Almighty. Uh, they became uh, so focused, uh, completely disregarding the one who could change things, uh, that he allowed them to find what they thought they needed. But it was bitter. It was bitter. And I wonder how many of us have ever experienced that. A lot of times in life, Yah will let you find the thing that you thought would make you happy or fulfilled, only to discover that it wasn't all that you thought it was going to be. In other words, it was bitter. He'll let you find that relationship or that career or that notoriety or that pleasure only to discover that the best life has to offer is bitter if you don't have Yah, if you don't have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with Yeshua. And so many people spend all their lives climbing the corporate ladder or the ladder of success only to find out at the end of their life their ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Amen. That's putting the focus in the wrong place. That's looking after the need and not looking to the need meter. If you want something that bad, so badly that you're willing to ignore the one who's able to change everything and provide what you need, and you put that thing above Elohim, you're making that thing into an idol. All right. And, and idolatry is bitter. It's an abomination. And so he may let you find that thing that you're worshiping. Some people worship career advancement. Uh, some people worship some, some idea of who they need to be or what they need to look like. And they spend so much time in the, in the, the mirror uh, with vain pursuits. And, and the Almighty may allow you to find what you think that you want, only to find that it's bitter once you have it. Yeah, you got that fancy house. You, you bought that car you have been dreaming about all your life. You know, you have that man or that woman you thought was going to make you happy. He'll let you find water. They were searching for water, and they found water. The problem was it was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. And when you can't drink it, it doesn't satisfy your thirst. And there's nothing out there that can satisfy the longing soul except for a deep, personal, intimate relationship with Yeshua. If you try to put anything above that, you're into idolatry and you're going to continue to lack and not be satisfied and not be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Yeshua said, for what is a man profited if he gains all the world? If you got everything you thought you wanted and loses his own life because your priorities are not straight. Okay. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? Is that car of that value to you? Is it, is it so valuable to you that you're willing to exchange it for eternal life? That house, that relationship? Is there anything out there that you think you have to have that's so valuable to you that you're willing to exchange your eternal life, your eternal destiny? That's the lesson that Yeshua is teaching here. Because there are people out there that seek after those things as if they're so passionate that they'll never be fulfilled without it. And they, a lot of times they receive it. They get it, but they find out it's bitter. It doesn't produce for them what they had hoped that it would. Verse 27, for the son of Adam, speaking of Yeshua, is going to come in the esteem of his father with his messengers, with his angels, and then he shall reward each according to his works. So if you gained everything in life, that you thought you wanted, but you don't have Yeshua, it is bitter and unfulfilling. And there's nothing that this world has to offer that's more valuable than your relationship with Yah through Yeshua. Amen. They were unable to drink the water because it was bitter. Material possessions have never been able to satisfy and fulfill the longing of the human soul. Some of the most miserable people that you can find are the extremely wealthy. They have everything, but they have nothing. Drugs won't do it. Alcohol, sex, fame, fortune. The flesh longs for these things, but none of them can satisfy the real need of the soul. They're sweet to the mouth, but they're bitter to the stomach. 
Psalm 107, verse 8 says, Let them give thanks to Yah for his loving commitment and his wonders to the children of men, for he has satisfied a longing being. Your, your Bible may say he satisfies the longing soul and has filled the hungry being, the hungry person, the hungry being with goodness. Who does this? Who satisfies the longing soul? Yeshua. Who fills the hungry? Yeshua. That relationship that we have with Yah through Yeshua. They found the water, but it was bitter. And then briefly, the fourth thing is they grumbled. They grumbled, the people grumbled, but Moshe prayed. Grumbling is the worst thing you can do in a trial. 1 Peter 3.10 says, For he who wishes to love life or have an enjoyable life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. So if you want to love life or have an enjoyable life and see good days, you're going to have to manage your tongue. Keep it from grumbling and complaining and murmuring and speaking evil. It goes on to say, And his lips from speaking deceit. In other words, don't, don't lie. A half-truth is a whole lie. A lot of people go around telling half-truths. Amen? Yeah. Verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of Yah are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their grumblings. Is that what that says? Why do we act like that's what that says? The eyes of Yah are on the righteous, those that live rightly, and his ears are open to their prayers. So who was Yah listening to? The people were grumbling. Moshe was praying. Who had the attention of the Almighty? Moshe. Thank you. It says, but the face of Yah is against those who do evil. All right. And, and Peter's simply quoting Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. All right. Now, notice it says that they grumbled against Moshe. I mean, they had an issue, and they took it to man. Instead of taking their issue to the Almighty, they took the issue to man, as if Moshe was going to do something about it. Moshe was going to deliver them somehow. They looked to man as their source when they should have looked to Yah. Psalm 20, verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we remember the name of Yah, our Elohim. Who are you going to remember? Who are you going to remember in your wilderness? Who are you going to remember in your pit? Who are you going to remember when your back is bleeding and your feet are in stocks and you're in the belly of the prison at midnight? That's right. Why are you going to remember him? Because he can shake heaven and earth and send an earthquake and bust those shackles right off of you and open up your prison door and deliver you. Pull you up out of a pit. Can you say amen? You can have water out of a rock and manna that comes from heaven. Can you say amen? Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I shall answer you, and show you great and inaccessible or unattainable matters which you have not known. In other words, I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself if you call upon me. So Moshe knew that the answer was prayer, not grumbling. And Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 teaches us that. Do not worry at all, but in every matter. How many matters? Every matter, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to Elohim. And the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds through Messiah Yeshua. So it's wonderful that, that when we pray that we have the peace of Elohim that comes and mounts guard and garrisons our hearts and our minds, like a soldier that walks back and forth to make sure that the enemy doesn't come in and bring those rogue thoughts that we were talking about. Hallelujah. We have a peace that passes our understanding. We can't figure out how we have it, but we're thankful that we do. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? All right, number five. We just have a couple more. Y'all showed Moshe a tree. Now, this is really important because we talked about that. I, I reminded you about that to remember that when Moshe prayed, something didn't happen just immediately, like, like the rain or water started gushing out of a hole or a rock. But instead, there was a revelation that took place. And it's very, very important. Moshe received a revelation of Messiah's redemptive work when dying on the tree. That's what that tree represents. In other words, Yah preached Messiah to Moshe beforehand. Now, uh, is there any precedent for that? Absolutely. We see in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 where, where the scripture says that, 
that the good news of Messiah was preached to Abraham beforehand. Beforehand. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the nations by belief, belief in Yeshua, announced the good news to Abraham or Abraham beforehand, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. That's Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Also, Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, verse 9. So that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham or Abraham, the believer. So the scripture preached the good news of Yeshua, that all the nations could come to believe in Yeshua and receive the indwelling set-apart spirit in advance of Messiah coming. And that message of Messiah was preached to Abraham in the promise itself, that through him and his capital S seed, the Messiah, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And we know that that blessing, the greatest blessing of the new covenant is the indwelling set-apart spirit. And so the, the good news was preached to Avraham. Sometimes in the day that we're living in, people are confused about the good news. Hey, Avraham knew what the good news was. Moshe knew what the good news was. Moshe got a vision of Yeshua dying on the tree. He got a vision of the fact that people are going to have bitterness in their life. They're going to experience bitter waters. And only through the redemptive work of Messiah and belief upon him will their bitter waters become sweet. I mean, I used to serve the devil. I used to walk in darkness, hair down the middle of my back, dye jet black, earring in my ear, playing the rebel by the handbook. I, I was in the nightclubs. I was in the rock and roll clubs and, and all of that. I, I lived that lifestyle for a while. But I'm thankful that Yeshua comes to nightclubs. I'm thankful that he doesn't come in there for the same reason that I was going there. But he could find somebody like me in a nightclub or in a, a, a music venue or whatever it is, and saved me from the guttermost to the uttermost, turn my bitter waters into sweet, turn my life around, anoint me with a spirit, and call me to spread this good news of how Yeshua and his redemptive work can turn anyone's bitter waters into sweet waters, can turn their life around, could put them on a different course, and they could be used also to further the kingdom and help other people who are in the bitterness of, of life come to a place of sweetness through belief in Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so that's what Moshe saw. Uh, the scripture doesn't go into great detail, but it says that he saw a tree. He, he was shown a tree. And when he threw the tree into the bitter waters, the waters became sweet. Well, we know that preaching Messiah beforehand was something that Yah did quite often because we even see uh, in another place, in Isaiah 53, starting with verse 4, that Yeshayahu or Isaiah saw how Yeshua was going to turn our bitter waters into sweet waters. It says in Isaiah 53, 4, Truly he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains, yet we reckoned him smitten, stricken by Elohim and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookednesses. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. In other words, he came to make our bitter waters sweet. He took our bitterness upon himself so that he could give us his sweetness. It says, and by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. And so I want to give you one example before we close today of how Yeshua came into the life of a woman who was suffering deep, bitter waters. And how through a simple encounter, he was able to turn her bitter waters into sweet waters. And we find this in John chapter 4, verse 7 is the beginning. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, give me a drink. Now, he just did that to draw her in. She was coming there in the middle of the day because it was a time when there weren't a lot of people there. She was trying to avoid, I believe, the shame of, of her life and her lifestyle. Uh, she was a woman who had uh, suffered a lot and had been through a lot. And I don't know all the details, so I'm not going to make her out to be a horrible person. I just know that that she had a real need for, for a 
relationship that would satisfy her. And she had one husband, and it didn't work. And so she went and got another husband, and it didn't work. We don't have the details. We don't know why it didn't work. But we know that she was longing for a relationship, as most of us long for a, a true, satisfying relationship. And the second one didn't work. She, she had a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one. Can you imagine? Now, let me ask you this. Can you imagine the brokenness of someone who's been through five relationships? I'm, I mean, most Hollywood uh, actors uh, don't go through five. And so I don't know what the problem was. I don't, I don't have the details. I just know this is a broken woman that's been through a lot. And before I set myself up on, you know, a seat of judgment, I, I want to see her brokenness. And I want to have compassion on her, as Yeshua did. Uh, you know, Yeshua wept over Lazarus and the, the fact that he died. And he saw how his family uh, was, was mourning for him. And he wept. His heart was broken. And I, I feel like his heart was broken over this woman as well. He, he saw her bitter waters. And don't think for a second that Yeshua wasn't a master of the Torah. He knew exactly that the passage that we've been reading out of the Torah represented him. He knew what bitter waters looked like. And he knew what could make bitter waters sweet. And so he's addressing this woman. He's drawing her into the conversation. And he says, give me a drink. He didn't need a drink. He was engaging her, all right, into a conversation. Verse 9 says, The woman of Samaria therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Yehudi or a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Shemarin or Samaria? For Yehudim, Jews, do not associate with Samaritans. Yeshua answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of Elohim, all right, now he's talking kingdom business here. He's talking about living water or eternal life. If you knew the gift of Elohim and who it is who says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In other words, he would turn your bitter waters into sweet water. He's going to give you living water. He's going to provide for you eternal life. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Master, you have no vessel and the well is deep. She's thinking purely on a natural level exactly what the children of Israel were doing when they were three days in the wilderness and they didn't have any water. They weren't thinking about Yah. They weren't thinking about anything spiritual. They didn't even think about prayer. What were they thinking about? They were thinking about wanting to drink and grumbling against Moshe. Okay? So this woman, she's standing before Messiah, the only one who could provide living water, who could turn her bitter waters into sweet, and she's focused on natural things. Well, that's kind of uh, human nature to be that way. The woman said to him, Master, you have no vessel, and the well is deep. From where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Yaakov, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Yeshua answered and said to her, Everyone drinking of this water shall thirst again. In other words, this water is not satisfying. But whoever drinks of the water I give him shall certainly never thirst. Never thirst spiritually. This is spiritual water. And the water that I give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So you come here to drink from this well to satisfy your natural thirst. But if you'll believe upon me, I'll give you a well of water within your being that constantly springs up into everlasting life. I'm going to satisfy the thirsty soul. I'm looking into your life, and I see the bitterness. I see the brokenness. I see so many broken vessels in your life, and, and the pieces are laying all around you, and I have compassion on you, and I love you, and I want to do something for you that will change all of that. I'm about to throw the tree into your bitter waters and make your waters sweet. All right, so look at verse 15. The woman said to him, Master, give me this water so that I do not thirst nor come here to draw. So again, just as the children of Israel did in the wilderness, she was searching for natural water and didn't know the one who could give her living water was standing right there in front of her. Verse 16, Yeshua said to her, 
go call your husband. Now, what's he going to do? He's going to point out and highlight the bitterness of the waters that, that she's currently living in. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yeshua said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So he's exposing her bitter water, not in a, not in a vindictive, harsh way. He's just saying, I know, I know your life. I know your brokenness. I know, I know your bitterness. I know your pain. I, I know what's going on in your emotions. I know your thoughts. I know your torments. Some people are just tormented in their mind over something that they think that they have to have. And so that's what he's doing. He, he's just saying, I, I get you. I understand what you've been through. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Master, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you people, speaking of the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one needs to worship. Yeshua said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You, speaking of Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We, speaking of Jews, worship what we know because the deliverance is of the Yehudim. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father also does seek such to worship Him. Elohim is spirit, and those who worship him need to worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called anointed. When that one comes, he shall announce to us all. In other words, he will tell us all truth. Yeshua said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. In other words, I'm the one who's going to Die on the tree. I'm going to take the sin of the world upon myself. I'm going to take all of your brokenness. The chastisement of your peace will be upon me. In other words, the punishment that brings you peace, I will bear for you. And by my stripes, the stripes on my back, I will heal you. And that's not just talking about physically. That's talking about healing us, uh, spirit, soul, and body. We will be completely healed. In other words, he's going to cast the tree into her bitter waters and make her life sweet. In other words, she is going to have an opportunity to believe upon him. She is going to have an opportunity to repent of her sins and turn. She's going to have an opportunity to trust in Yeshua, to be forgiven. And she's going to take that opportunity in this moment. She has an encounter, supernatural encounter with Yeshua, and he makes her bitter waters sweet. He heals her of her condition, her spiritual condition, and gives her a whole new lease on life. And what does she do with it? She runs back into the city, and she starts telling everyone how she met a man who turned her bitter waters into sweet. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then I want to close, finally, with the last statement that we read when we read the passage in Exodus 15. Starting with verse 26, and it is the promise of healing, not just of healing when we need a physical healing, but actually of, of covenant wellness. And I don't know about you, but I, I, want, to, I want to learn enough. I, I want to grow enough. I want to mature enough to where, with the help of the Spirit, I can walk consistently in covenant wellness. Don't you think that's what the Almighty really wants for His people? Amen. Instead of everybody needing the healing all the time, well, I'm thankful that we have a covenant for healing, honestly. But isn't it even better if we learn how to walk in covenant wellness? Amen? Amen. Because the Almighty does put a difference between us and the people in the world. And that's one of the differences that He places between His people and the people in the world is that we walk in covenant wellness. And so we do need to be healed. And we do believe that this year is the year that we uh, are those that would go forth and minister this message to the bitter waters of the world, the people who are around about us. But we can't bring sweet 
waters, to bitterness, if we have our own bitter waters. So we need to be healed. Amen. We need to be healed today. So let's look at the promise. Exodus chapter 15, starting with verse 26. And he, Yah said, if you diligently obey the voice of Yah. So we need to learn to follow his leadership. If you diligently obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes. Who determines what's right? He does. So we need to stop doing what's right in our eyes. Is that right? Amen. And shall listen to his commands. And many people in religion are just dug in. They don't want to hear anything about commandments. When you start talking about commandments, they turn off. And they want to start talking about perverted grace. And they say, you know, grace leads them to a place where they can be lawless. Now, they don't say it in those terms, but they imply it with everything they say. And then they want to accuse you of being a law keeper. Well, you know what I say. If you're not a law keeper, what are you? A law breaker. All right. So we, we have the righteous one, Yeshua, who kept the law perfectly. We also have the unrighteous one, the anti-Messiah. He's the opposite of Yeshua. And uh, he disobeys. And so there's two camps in the world. Which, which camp do you want to be in? The one who lived rightly before the Almighty, who said, follow me? Or the one that's defined in Scripture as the lawless one? So we can decide. There is no gray area. All right, so we need to do what's right in his eyes. Listen to his commands. Guard all his laws. It says, I shall bring. If we do that, Yah says, I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Nitzrites. Now, let me say one quick thing here. I, when I was in college, I went to seven or eight different colleges and universities. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be, so I studied everything. I have more hours than most people who have college degrees, and I don't have one because I didn't focus on any one particular thing long enough to get a degree. But I have more hours than most people. But I did take a, a philosophy course, and, and the philosophy course was all about if-then statements. If then, it was called logic. It was under the, the, the heading of philosophy, but it was, a, it was a logic course. It was all about if then statements. Now, so we find in the Bible scores and scores of if then statements. The Almighty says, if you do this, then I will do that. It's that simple. And this is one of them right here. So if we diligently obey the voice of Yah, if we do what's right in His eyes, if we listen to His commands, if we guard all His laws, He says, then I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites. In other words, if you don't live like a covenant breaker, I won't punish you like a covenant breaker. That's the context here. Now, we, we know that not all sickness is because of someone's personal sin. We know that even Shaul said that he, he had a physical ailment that was given to him to humble him because of a great revelation that he received. So not all, not all sickness is because of a particular sin of an individual. But in this context, the Almighty is saying, look, if you don't act like a covenant breaker, you won't get punished like a covenant breaker. In other words, I won't put the sicknesses on you that I put on the Egyptians. All right. And he goes on to say, for I am Yah. Who heals you? Your healer. Amen. I am your healer. It is a covenant promise. It is one of the first covenant promises that we see in Scripture. The Almighty wants us to know that He is our healer. He's the one who will bring us back to health. He's the one who will keep us well if we are covenant people and walk in His ways. We can expect those things. Can you say amen? amen. Now, a, a couple of uh, quick scriptures, and then we're going to close. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 45. It says, and when Moshe ended speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, Set your heart on all the words with which I warn you today, so that you command your children to guard to do all the words of this Torah. For it is not a worthless word for you, because it is your life. It is your what? It is your life. And by this word, you prolong your days on the soil which you pass over the yard and to possess. So you have... Life and prolonged days if we are defined by the Scripture. Now, to me, that puts a priority on the Scripture. There's nothing in life more important than the Scripture. It puts the priority right where it should be. We are people of the Word. We must allow the Word to define us. The more we become like the definition that's in the Word, the more we walk in the blessing. Amen? 
we, we should be able to get to the place where we don't need a healing because we're walking in covenant wellness. Now, that's, that's a high bar, isn't it? That's setting the standard high, but Yeshua always did that. And the scripture always does that. Be perfect as I'm perfect. Wow. <laughs> You're setting the, setting the standard pretty high there. You know? But he wants us to, to try to attain that through the help of the Spirit, right? And so we have another verse that echoes that. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. My son, listen to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Guard them in the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them and healing or health to all their flesh. Yah is in the business of turning our bitter waters into sweet waters. He's the only one who can satisfy. Yeshua is the one who satisfies the longing soul. So when we're out in our wilderness wandering, we always look to him. He's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd who will lead us through the valley. And when we get through the valley, the wilderness valley, what happens on the other side? There's a table prepared before us in the very presence of our enemies. Amen. He anoints our heads with oil. Our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of Yah forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.